much for agreeing to chair the session. I will leave it to you to invite and introduce the panelists. Um, as like the last session, we have 10 minutes for every speaker and I would kindly request everyone to stick to their 10 minutes. Although I know you'll, you'll ensure that they don't go beyond that. Um, if people want to eat lunch on time, then <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much and over to you, Dr. Glati. Mike, Mike, please. Hello. As the center down, let me start introducing. We are very short of time. It's not just securing grain. You have to secure your food security for lunch too. So uh, we are already running about 45 minutes late from the program. Uh, either it has to be a cut on your timings and your introductions and whatnot. But let me straight away go to the business. Uh, Dr. Raj Kumar uh, is a cropping pattern. Why don't you get there to start off? Uh, he's a cropping systems agronomist for the Bangalore Institute of South Asia. He's a doctorate in agronomy. From CCS Haryana Agriculture University, uh, moved to CIMET in 2009, moved to DSI in 2011. He has more than 12 years experience. I think that should be. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So, good morning, all of you. So, on behalf of uh, Borlog Institute for South Asia, Rajendra Agricultural University, and Bihar Agricultural University, I am presenting the work, uh, what we are doing to promote and disseminate the storage system in Bihar. So, why storage system is important in Bihar? Because most of the people, if we talk about the both tarvage losses or storage losses, they go for a quantity. So quantity is much less. As compared to quantity, there are several other factors that uh, reduce the farmer's income. So you see that in case of quantity, most of the farmers, they lose 8 to 10 percent quantity. And at the same time, they lose the quality because the eastern IGP is a highly humid uh, area and you can see that most of the farmers, whatever they have their, at their home for consumption, they dry three, four times in a year. So that is a huge labor cost involved in that. And third one, that is economic loss. Because at the time of uh, harvesting, you can see that uh, Bihar still not have uh, proper kind of uh, mandi system what we have in uh, Haryana and Punjab and they have packs but all packs are not effective for procurement uh, of the food grains. So you can see that sometimes 20 to 30 percent less price at the time of harvesting and most of the farmers forced to, to sell that produce at 20 to 30 percent less rate because they don't have proper storage facility. They don't have facility to handle that large volume. So you can see that if we compare the total factor, then the price is an important factor in storage. If the farmers, they have proper storage facility, then they can increase their income out of total losses 54%. Only the quantity is contributed 27%. Uh, and we most of our focus on the quantity. 10% or 5% is not important. But important thing is that price at the time of harvest. And second thing, you see that the uh, most of the wheat seed in Bihar that is imported from Punjab and Haryana. Because due to high humidity and lack of storage facility, all farmers they import the seed from all the traders import the seed from Punjab and Haryana. 
and in our several uh, projects we observed that when we use the different kind of bags then we can increase the, the germination percentage because the traditional method of storing the grains or seed in Bihar that use the seed viability. So the, this is the another opportunity in Bihar. So you can see that we tested several type of bag, capsule bag, hermetic uh, bag of uh, different companies. So we found that these are bags are very effective to improve the germination percentage and that can help VR farmers to save their seeds and less depend on the farm. So the journey we started from 2015. So in collaboration with the Illinois University ADMA uh, Institute, we have one project for three years, 2015 to 18. And before that, there is a, we don't have any systematic pro project on post-harvest losses in Bihar. So we started awareing people that post-harvest is also an important part. And at that time, the Union Agriculture Minister was launched that uh, project in Patna and we all four partners, three partners are Rajendra Agriculture University, Bihar Agriculture University and Visa developed and disseminate the technologies to prevent the post harvest losses. And another project we incorporate in our existing pro project. We got one NAPAR funded project for climate smart agriculture in Bihar in eight, eight districts. So in that eight districts, in collaboration with the Illinois University, we integrated this post harvest process activities also there. So these are the eight districts managed by ICR ITR, BAU Sabor, Dr. Rajendra Prasad Central Agriculture University, and BISA. So we are promoting the technologies to reduce the post harvest process. What about? So these are the different activities we are doing in Bihar with the farmers. Uh, we are distributing the base to the community members. <coughs> these uh, bags. And we developed the seed distribution model to identify the, the farmers' ability to bear the cost of these bags. We gave the subsidy through these uh, projects. So we found that uh, farmers in Bihar, they are able to purchase these uh, bags at 30 rupees per bag. And we organized the several workshops at Patna to aware the importance of these super bags. So these are the several newspaper cuttings which are shown. And uh, our colleague, Dr. Anil Jasab already mentioned that uh, BAU, RAU, and we showed the importance of these hermetic bags and the government of VR under uh, National Food Security Mission, they already started giving the subsidy on these grain pro bags. So this is the big outcome of the ADMI uh, project in Bihar. So after these two projects, at least people's mindset is changed. So people of Bihar started thinking about the post harvest losses and many private companies looking for the opportunity to sell the grain super bags in Bihar. And the policy planner, they also understand that this is a real issue and they started giving the subsidy on these instruments required for reducing the post harvest losses. And farmers' demand is growing. They are looking the availability at local level. So we still need to woman friendly technology because most of the post harvest produce is handled by the women. So we need the technologies which can, which can uh, woman friendly so that can help more to the yeah, BR farmers. Thank you. Thank you.
claim for these bank. Also, if we look at the storage loss, his storage loss is around 6.2%. Around 6% you can see, but with the hermetically sealed bag, almost there is nothing. So that means we can really save the losses, and that can contribute to the total uh, uh, national food demand in the Bangladesh. What is the reason behind the harm, uh, reducing this post-harvest loss? We have tested, we have found that, that CO2 has been increased over the time while oxygen is reduced, and that helps to uh, kill the insects or larva staying in the grain probiotic. So it's a quite fascinating to see without injecting, fumigating CO2, we can really have the hermetically sealed storage technology. Also, we have looked at the germination quality. Even after nine months, we can see the germination remain 90%, where is the acceptable limit in Bangladesh is 80%. So that is also really good for us and for Bangladesh government to look at the, uh, this issue. So in the first phase, we work with the farmers, and we see it really works well in the farmer's field. Of course, we have the policy issue to use in the for the grain, but for the seed, there is no problem. So that's something that we need to work together in future. Then we talked with the BAGC, it's a Bangladesh Agriculture Development Corporation, which is under the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, who are actually supplying uh, more than 40% of seed to the farmers. So we are really glad that they have joined us at the initiative. And <coughs> phase two, actually, we are now doing some of the experiments with the hermetic bags in their storage facility, sea storage facility, that see and show them that how it works in their facility and to build their confidence whether really it works uh, in their storage facility. So that this is uh, actually that's something which will be really have uh, quite good impact for our nations if we can really introduce very best practices in their warehouses. Of course, in the next uh, uh, year, we'll work with the Pocon also in that storage facility, see which one is, is a good for their uh, storage. Uh, one thing just to mention, to keep uh, what uh, actually Dr. Uh, Mahmoud said, that to keep their storage uh, safe, they need to do the fumigation, spray insecticides, also do redrying. It's all cost money and time. So if we can really keep this uh, uh, produce in the, or seed in the hermetically sealed bag, we can really set those uh, uh, intervention. Uh, one initiative also we are uh, currently running uh, with the help of IFRI and the Ministry of uh, uh, Prevention of post harvest Loss. We are looking at the off farms hermetic storage bag, that what I say, that with the cocoon. So how it works at the Miller level, so this is something that we wanted to show that we have start, started to thinking and see whether really it can benefit <coughs> our millers as well as in near future the big farmers. Of course the price is one of the issue of the hermetic bag or the coupon that we need to work together about to reduce this price. But for the first sale we can see that it's really helping uh, our millers uh, even they don't need any shade for keeping the produce. So we'll come up with more results that we can share next time. And we, to Angus farmers, we have given several training in first phase, also in the phase two. We have given, uh, we are giving also training to our farmer about this technology. Beside the dryer, that also the precursor of storing the penny. So that's something that we have developed, the PUSTR dryer, which is really helping farmers to dry their produce in bad weather. So, and the thing is uh, actually we want to motivate our farmer and we can see already the motivation from the farmer side. So we need to work more on the policy side to incorporate in the government policy with the harmonic seal bag. Some of the success story you can see the Kodeza Begum is uh, living in full food district and he's using a hermetically sealed bag and he's happy with the bag and he's now doing business with the hermetic bag. And some other women farmers also following her in the in that village. So he's producing money out of that. This is also Nikhil Bisha, as you can see, is living in Joshua area. And he's really quick learner and technology adapter in this area. And he's a model farmer now in Joshua area. And he's selling 
see it in that area. Also, Taimur Rahman is a village doctor who follows, actually people follow doctor and teacher. So it's a kind of good thing that Taimur Rahman is also adapting this technology there. So this is some of the success story that I am sharing with you. There are many success stories that we can share. But the good thing that we are working together. So uh, USA is there, India is here, and Bangladesh we are working, and government side is also there is a good initiative. So if we really work together, so hopefully we can really come up with a good solution for the uh, benefit of the farmers. And that's all, and thank you very much. right to it. Uh, so today, the benefits of improved storage technology, how it benefits farmers, it reduces, it, it uh, reduces uh, quality losses and quantity losses and uh, fetches better market prices for farmers and you know helps increase their household income. But I'm going to talk about whether there is demand for a technology like this. Is, do farmers value such a technology? Is, is there any willingness to pay? for improved st storage technology among smallholder farmers uh, in India? The short answer is that yes, there is. And I promise I'll get to the long answer soon, right? But the short answer is that yes, farmers are willing to pay for improved storage technology. We, we went to Bihar, we, we conducted a large randomized control trial, a field experiment, and measured farmers' willingness to pay for such a technology. And, and we found that for improved storage technology, hermetically sealed bags of 50 kgs, Farmers were willing to pay three times the price of traditional jute bags. What they pay around eight rupees now, and they're willing to pay around 25 rupees for improved uh, storage technology. And that willingness to pay increases further if we inform farmers about the food safety issues, about uh, the detrimental health effects of aflatoxins. What are aflatoxins? How can consuming aflatoxins be very bad for health? And how these bags can help reduce uh, aflatoxin contamination. So the next logical question is that if hermetic bags are made available in the market, will farmers go ahead and buy them? The far especially the farmers who stand to benefit the most from adopting this technology, will they simply go ahead and, and buy that te technology? That's a more complicated answer. And, and that's so because we know from multiple examples from around the world that there are many beneficial, good, useful technologies that remain unadopted. For example, um, water filters or uh, uh, smokeless uh, chulas, clean cooking stuffs, or mosquito bed nets. A lot of these technologies that are good, beneficial, that we know for a fact, remain unadopted because good technology does not necessarily translate into high rates of adoption. There is, there is some sort of, there are multiple reasons why, why it's not uh, adopted. And there is some sort of a push that is needed to, to promote this adoption. So what, so what is it that we can do to promote the adoption of improved storage technology? <coughs> well, one thing that we can do, then, and we know from past research, is that we can promote experience with the technology. We know a lot of technologies are experience goods. And, and Gaining experience with, use, with using a technology can help users understand the benefits and weigh them against the costs of, of that technology. And hopefully, if it's a good technology, uh, improve the adoption rates. How can we do that? We can do that by providing a large one-time subsidy to, to help farmers gain this experience with improved storage technology. Experience to, to see the benefits and make a more informed choice ado uh, about adoption. Now, you know, as economists often say that uh, in God we trust, all else must bring data. So here is my data for you. We went to Bihar, we worked with 4,000 farmers in 80 villages in five districts of Bihar. 
to test whether providing a large one-time subsidy actually increases not just the adoption in that season when subsidy is provided, but also adoption in later seasons. And these, these farmers that we worked were mostly small farmers. 83% of them had less than one hectare of, uh, of land and mostly produce, uh, grew stable crops like rice, wheat, uh, and maize. They, we provided farmers uh, the opportunity to buy these 50 kg hermetic grain provides yeah. and, uh, uh, at, at very uh, subsidized rates. And the subsidy, we varied the subsidy from zero to 100%, which is no subsidy to completely free. Then we waited for a year, that is two agricultural seasons. We let the farmers use that technology, experience that technology. And when and then after a year, we, we went back to the field and provided farmers another opportunity to buy these hermetic bags and measured their willingness to pay for it. Here is a snapshot of what we found. We found that experience with technology increases the demand, not just in the season when the subsidy is provided, but even later demand, right? Farmers who had used the improved storage technology for a year were 20, had a 26% higher willingness to pay for it as compared to farmers who, have, who were first time buyers, who were first time users. The second thing that we found was that a one time subsidy helped farmers gain that experience. It made farmers more likely to, to buy improved storage, not just in this season, but in the following seasons, and helped them understand the benefits of it. The most interesting thing that I found was uh, uh, that the farmers who who benefited, who eventually benefited the most from adopting this technology, who who reduced the losses the most, who experienced the highest benefits, were actually the farmers who had some of the lowest initial willingness to pay for that technology. That was, uh, at least as an economist, that's a very uh, counterintuitive result to us. That because we think that people who will benefit the most from technology should also be willing to pay the most for it. Uh, somehow that was not the case. And thus, providing a large initial subsidy was crucial in getting the technology to these farmers who actually benefited the most from adopting it. However, there is a caveat. We also had some farmers who received 100% subsidy, who received the bags for free. The farmers who received the bags for free in the first year had a significantly lower willingness to pay for it in the later season. That was not the case even when the subsidy was 80% or 90%. There is something with uh, providing stuff for free. It's economists call it discontinuity at zero, but I'm sure it's it's pretty intuitive. All of us understand that. So just to quickly uh, summarize what we find: improved storage technology can deliver large gains to to smallholder farmers only if adopted. <coughs> we need to start worrying adop uh, about adoption and not just about how beneficial the technology is. There is existing demand for improved storage technology that increases further when we provide information to farmers about aflatoxin, about uh, food safety issues. However, these, uh, this, this technology is still very expensive. Uh, and there is no way that smallholder farmers in places like Bihar, Odisha, Uttar Pradesh will be able to pay a dollar for a bag. Right? Uh, so, 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 of course, subsidy is needed. And then the demand increases with experience and a large one-time subsidy, the, the first use subsidy helps farmers gain this experience, particularly, particularly the farmers who benefited the most from adopting this technology. However, subsidy is good as long as it is not 100%. Just don't give it for free, okay? <laughs> Thank you, that's, that's all. I still have a question. You know, subsidy and adoption rate, but how much was the gain? Because subsidy of 70 rupees, 70 percent or whatever you are giving has to be compared with what was the net gain? What is the data? <laughs> See, Shahid says everything, Alex says everything. <laughs> Sir, we will put up an exhibition. It's a exhibit session right during lunch. 
Nobody told me. <laughs> Information asymmetry. <laughs> so now with Katie, before you give your detailed presentation, I think give us a few glimpses of what this bag is about. Thank you. Uh, she's a professor. She has been people like uh, <laughs> Pallavi. Uh, she's a professor at the University of uh, Illinois and uh, has been working uh, uh, as a staff of economists in charge of agriculture for the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House. But they don't use bags, they use only silos. <laughs> you should be advising the Prime Minister of India. <laughs> Over to you, thanks. And look forward to your impact in China, India, and Sub Saharan Africa with all the best wishes. Thanks, Dr. Gulati. I'm, I'm here purely to basically answer Dr. Gulati's question from earlier about cost-benefit analysis. But first, I'm going to pretend to be an ag economist, or an, an, sorry, an ag engineer, which is very embarrassing in a, in a room full of ag engineers. Let me just talk about the bag for a second in, in really simple terms because I'm not an engineer. So um, when, when I had my colleague, uh, Dr. Ken Rausch, sort of explain to me what on earth these things were and why they work, I mean, they're, they're basically double double line, triple line plastic, right, that, uh, that you store grain in, and then you, it, and if you store the grain, and then you seal hermetically, and then if you store the grain at the appropriate moisture content, the grain respirates, producing CO2. And so because it's producing CO2, it, you basically, just as was mentioned earlier, you, it acts as a, as a fumigant, right? It also reduces uh, growth of mold spores and other things like that. So it's uh, it's retaining, it's allowing the the basically the moisture content to stay stable over time. It's reducing uh, uh, should reduce insect loss and uh, loss to uh, to molds and other things like that. Again, forgive forgive me for the slightly hand wavy version, but uh, if you have questions, there's a bunch of again engineers in the room that can answer them in more detail. Um, what we're going to try and do is say, all right, we, there's been a lot of work in the lab that shows that these bags can have success, can, can actually reduce losses, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to ask, do we actually see that in the field? And in what dimensions do we see that? And by we, I should note, there's my name up there, but this is a, this is a large group project done including with the, by Dr. Shukla, Dr. Paul Watra, who's also another Illinois grad, but also Dr. Jot, uh, and then our colleagues from uh, from Bihar, from Bihar Agricultural University, Sumit uh, Kumar, and then uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar and Dr. Vishal Kumar uh, from uh, the Rajendra Pradesh Central Agricultural University. So again, many, many, many thanks to, to the team for this. There we go. So we're going to ask again, firstly, just does this work? Does it work in the field? And the way we're going to think about this is, does it work over several dimensions of food security? That's kind of the way we're categorizing things. Partially because we want to look, does it measure, does it reduce physical losses when used by farmers? Does it also improve quality? And as an economist, by that we're interested in, does it raise price? We're also interested in what Dr. Jot mentioned, in that does it, by allowing farmers to store more cheaply for longer, can farmers actually benefit from the arbitrage opportunities of not having to sell right after harvest when prices are lower? We also look at utilization, and by that we think of food safety issues, and, and probably we already teed this up talking about aflatoxins. We looked to ask sort of what's happening in terms of aflatoxin, does this help reduce aflatoxin? Um, and then we look at this question of, store, of stability over time. And, and part of their work really looking, trying to understand farmers' behavior. Are farmers actually using this to store longer? Are they using it to store more? Um, are they using it to consume grain themselves instead of having to buy grain on the market when grain prices are high later in the season? So those are the pieces we're going to try and look at. Uh, we do this, as, as Pallavi mentioned, using a randomized control trial, where some, some farmers don't get access to the bags, other farmers do get access to the bags at different prices, but then we have several different arms of this RCT where we also kind of look, where we, and we do an information treatment with some folks. We also ask a subset of farmers uh, to hold on to the, to the grain in their bags and to sell one month after harvest, two months after harvest, both grains stored in the bags and grains stored in traditional jute bags to see what prices they were getting from traders. We also do a trader, a sort of what we call a mystery seller experiment, working with our farmers to go to their own traders and to have those traders value grain samples uh, and say like, okay, how much would you give me for grain for, for this 
grain quality, how much would you give me for this grain quality, to pretending it was their grain quality, but it was really ours. So we knew exactly the specification of those that grain quality as a way, to, again, to try and get at what premium are traders willing to pay for different qualities of grain. So that, that's kind of the, a, the set of things that we looked at. And the whole point of this was to try and get to, again, a cost-benefit number in the end result. Where we're working in Bihar, as mentioned, uh, we worked in sort of rice, wheat, uh, lentils, and maize. And I'm going to focus a lot on the maize results today, but happy to talk about the other ones later. Um, that sort of a, gives you a sense of the timeline of what we did. In terms of the physical quantity <laughs> measures, this is where we had great help from our ag engineering colleagues. Uh, to try and figure out sort of all the way from grains sort of lost at harvest to grains lost at storage, et cetera, et cetera. So what was the potential value of the crop that people were growing versus how much were they actually receiving in the end results? So we could try and get at losses at different stages of the chain. So results. Firstly, on the availability side of the story. And in here, think about the physical food, the physical losses. One thing is sort of an interesting side note, when we asked farmers how much they thought they lost, they were saying ah, about two to three percent. When we measured what they were losing, uh, they were losing about three to four percent during harvest, but up to about 11 percent during storage. Now that was, this is for maize, and it's just a little bit lower for, for wheat and a little bit lower for rice. Um, but it's much, much higher than what the farmers were reporting themselves. And so we asked them, we said, okay, well, what, what do you, you know, why are, what's going on, guys? Why are you, and they say, oh yeah, that's just cost of doing business. Like, of course, of course, we always have to scrape off like the top layer. That's not loss, you know. So, so long story short, this is a little bit of a, a cautionary tale of using self-reported numbers, um, which we kind of knew. Um, and then we, we tested sort of over time how much people were losing. We're looking at sort of the quantity lost in bags started by the same farmers using jute bags versus medically sealed bags. And we are seeing a dramatic reduction in loss to rodents and loss to uh, insect damage and loss to mold. So we're looking at sort of, uh, so the, this, this side of the picture is for, for rice. The blue bar is a traditional bag, the damage from rodents, and it was again over is about 11% uh, versus hermetic bags is less than 1%. For uh, fungus and pest damage, if for rice, it's about 8.6% from the jute bags and 0% for the hermetic bags. For maize, the, the differences were even bigger. Again, this is for rodent damage, almost 17%, none in the hermetic bags. For uh, fungus and pest damage, it's about 12% versus a little less than 2% in the hermetic bags. So, so again, we're seeing pretty dramatic reductions of, of physical losses in grains. The next thing we looked at was, okay, well, what is this? So we know that farmers should get more money because they have more grain to sell, but are they getting higher prices from quality? And we did both a bunch of physical measures of quality testing, so they're looking at broken grains and things like that. Um, but then we also, as I mentioned, we did this, this experiment where we asked farmers to sell grain stored in bag, both types of bags, one month after harvest, two months after harvest. And that's where we're getting these numbers, where we're seeing about a 10% price premium per kg that they were getting from the, the grain sold in the medically sealed bags. Um, we also found that, uh, that, that farmers, we do see farmers, I'll talk more about this, selling later, which also can allow them to get possibly higher prices, uh, and just higher probability of storing it all. Okay. Then we look at, again, the sort of food safety component, the utilization component of food security, uh, and here we're we're really using this as a way to think about aflatoxin contamination. We see, so we test all a bunch of samples of particularly focusing on, on maize, but also wheat for aflatoxin. And we were finding about 37% of all samples in traditional bags had aflatoxin levels that were higher than acceptable. So that's big, and some of those numbers were off the charts. Bigger problem in maize, as you'd expect, but still even in wheat, we saw some, some measures of aflatoxin that were pretty high. <coughs> Um, versus 4% in the hermetically sealed bag. So not zero, but much, much reduced. The other thing is it does is because, again, if you're using CO2 to essentially act as a fumigant, farmers weren't using uh, things like cell fossil and phosphate to, as a fumigant. So in as much as we worry about health effects in terms of exposure to that 
those would be reduced. Stability, in terms of the stability component of food security, we do see farmers having access to their own grains for food for more longer part of the season, because they're storing more, they're storing longer, and more farmers are storing. So, and we see this uh, translate into increased consumption from their own stocks and less purchases from the market. Okay? So this is, this again just means that there's more food availability, not only sort of at one time, but sort of over, over the season. Last, uh, and, and I'll get to the actual cost benefit numbers in two seconds, we also do a, a choice experiment with the end consumers to try and understand, to try and get at some sense of uh, willingness to pay for kind of higher quality grains, and here particularly we're focused in on aflatoxin. And so we, we go into markets in Patna and Delhi, uh, and as well as in a number of rural villages, um, to, to ask about that and sort of show, give people the, the statistics that we were finding in terms of aflatoxin in different grains, ask them about their willingness to pay, and we found consumers are willing to pay about 18 to 30 percent for certified aflatoxin free grains. And that's a pretty big number. We ran exactly the same experiment with the traders, and they were willing to pay a little bit more, but not very much, one to two percent. And we asked why, and partially they didn't expect to be able to recoup that, that price going higher up. So when Dr. Gulati points to this question of sort of information and supply chains and stuff like that, we think there's an issue here. Awesome. So putting this together, into a cost-benefit analysis. I won't go through all of the, the, the numbers. Let me focus in on, in on the punchline. This is for maize, where the effects were largest. Um, we're looking at an additional benefit per 50 kg bag of about, uh, you know, some, around 90 rupees or a little bit more. That means that farmers could pay for the bag within a single season. This is per season. Okay. Uh, for for wheat, it was less, about 40% less than that, if I'm remembering correctly, because of slightly lower loss numbers in jute bags. So there, farmers might have to wait a season and a half to repay the cost of the bag. But long story short, it seems to be, it, it seems to actually be paying for itself if farmers can actually, you know, learn about bags themselves. So in short, we're looking at these bags improving availability side of food security by reducing quantity loss, improving access by improving farmers' income because it's increasing quality and therefore the price farmers can receive. It's improving utilization in terms of reducing food uh, potential food contaminants. And it's improving stability. So it's, the, it's kind of a nice thing. It's a simple in way technology, but it's having these multiple effects um, that lead to a, a pretty good, pretty quick payback rate, particularly for maize, also, but also for wheat, and, and even for rice. Rice it takes a little, they get a little longer. That's it. Thank you very much. I have a special request to get, and that is because many of us not really know because we play with economic numbers. We are not people on the ground looking at what sort of bag is this. Either you should have brought a bag here or not to. Sir, we have it. Sir, we will put up an exhibition. It's okay. Exhibit session right during lunch. Nobody told me. Information asymmetry. <laughs> so now with Katie, before you give your detailed presentation, I think give us a few glimpses of what this bag is about. Thank you. Uh, she's a professor. She has trained people like uh, uh, Pallavi. Uh, she's a professor at the University of uh, Illinois. And I've been working uh, uh, as a staff of economist in charge of agriculture for the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House. But they don't use bags, they use only silos. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. Thanks. And look forward to your impact in China, India, and sub Saharan Africa with all the best wishes. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Glody. I'm, I'm here purely to basically answer Dr. Glody's question from earlier about cost benefit analysis. But first, I'm going to pretend to be an ag economist, or an, an, sorry, an ag engineer, which is very embarrassing in a, in a room full of ag engineers. Let me just talk about the bag for a second in, in really simple terms because I'm not an engineer. 
So um, when when I had my colleague uh, Dr. Ken Rauch sort of explain to me what on earth these things were and why they work, I mean they're they're basically double double line, triple lined plastic, right? That uh, that you store grain in, and then you it, and if you store the grain and then you seal hermetically, and then if you store the grain at the appropriate moisture content, the grain respirates, producing CO2. And so because it's producing CO2, it, you basically, just as was mentioned earlier, you, it acts as a, as a fumigant, right? It also reduces uh, growth of mold spores and other things like that. So it's, uh, it's retaining, it's allowing the, the, basically the moisture content to stay stable. Over time, it's reducing, uh, uh, should reduce insect loss and uh, loss to, uh, to molds and other things like that. Again, forgive, forgive me for the slightly hand wavy version, but uh, if you have questions, there's a bunch of again, engineers in the room that can answer them in more detail. Um, what we're going to try and do is say, all right, we, there's been a lot of work in the lab that shows that these bags can have success, can, can actually reduce losses, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to ask, do we actually see that in the field? And in what dimensions do we see that? And by we, I should note, there's my name up there, but this is a, this is a large group project done including with the, by Dr. Shukla, Dr. Paul Watsra, who's also another Illinois grad, but also Dr. Jot, uh, and then our colleagues from uh, from Bihar, from Bihar Agricultural University, Sumit uh, Kumar, and then uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar and Dr. Vishal Kumar uh, from uh, the Rajendra Pradesh Central Agricultural University. So again, many, many, many thanks to, to the team for this. There we go. So we're going to ask again, firstly, just, does this work? Does it work in the field? And the way we're going to think about this is, does it work over several dimensions of food security? That's kind of the way we're categorizing things. Partially because we want to look, does it measure, does it reduce physical losses when used by farmers? Does it also improve quality? And as an economist, by that we're interested in, does it raise price? We're also interested in what Dr. Jot mentioned, in that does it, by allowing farmers to store more cheaply for longer, can farmers actually benefit from the arbitrage opportunities of not having to sell right after harvest when prices are lower? We also look at utilization, and by that we're thinking food safety issues, and, and Paula, we already teed this up talking about aflatoxins. We look to ask sort of what's happening in terms of aflatoxin, does this help reduce aflatoxin? Um, and then we look at this question of, store, of stability over time. And in part of there, we're really looking, trying to understand farmers' behavior. Are farmers actually using this to store longer? Are they using it to store more? Um, are they using it to consume grain themselves instead of having to buy grain on the market when grain prices are high later in the season? So those are the pieces we're going to try and look at. Uh, we do this, as, as Pallavi mentioned, using a randomized control trial, where some, some farmers don't get access to the bags, other farmers do get access to the bags at different prices, but then we have several different arms of this RCT where we also kind of look, where we, and we do an information treatment with some folks. We also asked a subset of farmers uh, to hold on to the, to the grain in their bags and to sell one month after harvest, two months after harvest, both grains stored in the bags and grains stored in traditional jute bags to see what prices they were getting from traders. We also do a trader, a sort of what we call a mystery seller experiment, working with our farmers to go to their own traders and to have those traders value grain samples uh, and say like, okay, how much would you give me for grain, for, for this grain quality? How much would you give me for this grain quality? To pretending it was their grain quality, but it was really ours. So we knew exactly the specification of those that grain quality as a way to, again to try and get at what premium are traders willing to pay for different qualities of grain. So that, that's kind of the, the, the set of things that we looked at. And the whole point of this was to try and get to, again, a cost-benefit number in the end result. Where we're working in Bihar, as mentioned, uh, we worked in sort of rice, wheat, uh, lentils, and maize. And I'm going to focus a lot on the maize results today, but happy to talk about the other ones later. Um, that sort of a, gives you a sense of the timeline of what we did. In terms of the physical, Quantity measures, this is where we had great help from our ag engineering colleagues uh, to try and figure out sort of all the way from grains sort of lost at harvest to grains lost at storage, et cetera, et cetera. So what was the potential value of the crop that people were growing versus how much were they actually receiving in the end results? So we could try and get at losses at different stages of the chain. So results. 
Firstly, on the availability side of the story. And in here, think about the physical food, the physical losses. One thing is sort of an interesting side note, when we asked farmers how much they thought they lost, they were saying, ah, about two to three percent. When we measured what they were losing, uh, they were losing about three to four percent during harvest, but up to about 11 percent during storage. Now, that was, this is for maize, and it's just a little bit lower for, for wheat and a little bit lower for rice. Um, but it's much, much higher than what the farmers were reporting themselves. And so we asked them. We said, okay, well, what, what do you, you know, why are, what's going on, guys? Why are you, and they say, oh yeah, that's just cost of doing business. Like, of course, of course, we always have to scrape off like the top layer. That's not loss, you know. So, so long story short, this is a little bit of a, a cautionary tale of using self-reported numbers, um, which we kind of knew. Um, and then we, we tested sort of over time how much people were losing. We're looking at sort of the quantity lost in bags stored by the same farmers using jute bags versus medically sealed bags. And we are seeing a dramatic reduction in loss to rodents and loss to uh, insect damage and loss to mold. So we're looking at sort of, uh, so the, this, this side of the picture is for, for rice. The blue bar is a traditional bag, the damage from rodents, and it was again over is about 11% uh, versus hermetic bags was less than 1%. For uh, fungus and pest damage, if for rice is about 8.6% from the jute bags and 0% for the hermetic bags. For maize, the, the differences were even bigger. Again, this is for rodent damage, almost 17%, none in the hermetic bags. For uh, fungus and pest damage, about 12 percent versus a little less than two percent in their medic back. So, so again, we're seeing pretty dramatic reductions of, of physical losses in greens. The next thing we looked at was, okay, well, what is this? So we know that farmers should get more money because they have more green to sell, but are they getting higher prices from quality? And we did both a bunch of physical measures of quality testing, so they're looking at broken grains and things like that. Um, but then we also, as I mentioned, we did this, this experiment where we asked farmers to sell grain stored in bag both types of bags, one month after harvest, two months after harvest. And that's where we're getting these numbers, where we're seeing about a 10% price premium per kg that they were getting from the, the grain sold in the medically sealed bags. Um, we also found that, uh, that, that farmers, we do see farmers, I'll we'll talk more about this, selling later, which also can allow them to get possibly higher prices, uh, and just higher probability of storing it all. Then we look at, again, the sort of food safety component, the utilization component of food security. Uh, and here we're, we're really using this as a way to think about aflatoxin contamination. We see, so we test all a bunch of samples of particularly focusing on, on maize, but also wheat for aflatoxin. And we were finding about 37% of all samples in traditional bags had aflatoxin levels that were higher than acceptable. So that's big, and some of those numbers were off the charts. Bigger problem in maize, as you'd expect, but still even in wheat, we saw some, some measures of aflatoxin that were pretty high, uh, versus 4% in the hermetically sealed bag. So not zero, but much, much reduced. The other thing is it does, as because again, if you're using CO2 to essentially act as a fumigant, farmers weren't using uh, things like cell fossil and phosphate to, as a fumigant. So in as much as we worry about health effects in terms of exposure to that, those would be reduced. Stability, in terms of the stability component of food security, we do see farmers having access to their own grains for food for more longer part of the season, because they're storing more, they're storing longer, and more farmers are storing, generally. So, and we see this uh, translate into increased consumption from their own stocks and less purchases from the market. Okay. So this is, this again just means that there's more food availability, not only sort of at one time, but sort of over, over the season. Last, uh, and, and I'll get to the actual cost benefit numbers in two seconds, we also do a, a choice experiment with the end consumers to try and understand, to try and get at some sense of uh, willingness to pay for kind of higher quality grades. And here particularly, we're focused in on aflatoxin. And so we, we go into markets in Patna and Delhi, uh, and as well as in a number of rural villages, um, to, to ask about, that in sort of, Show, give people the, the statistics that we were finding in terms of aflatoxin 
in different grades, ask them about their willingness to pay, and we found consumers are willing to pay about 18 to 30 percent for certified aflatoxin-free grains. And that's a pretty big number. We ran exactly the same experiment with the traders, and they were willing to pay a little bit more, but not very much, one to two percent. And we asked why, and partially they didn't expect to be able to recoup that, that price going higher up. So when Dr. Gulati points to this question of sort of information and supply chains and stuff like that, we think there's an issue here. So putting this together into a cost-benefit analysis, I won't go through all of the, the, the numbers that we focus in on, in on the punchline. This is for maize, where the effects were largest. Um, we're looking at an additional benefit per 50 kg bag of about, uh, you know, somewhere around 90 rupees or a little bit more. That means that farmers could pay for the bag within a single season. This is per season. Okay. Uh, for, for wheat, it was less, about 40% less than that, if I'm remembering correctly, because of slightly lower loss numbers in jute bags. So there, farmers might have to wait a season and a half to repay the cost of the bag. But long story short, it seems to be, it, it, it seems to actually be paying for itself if farmers can actually, you know, learn about the bags themselves. So in short, we're looking at these bags improving availability side of food security by reducing quantity loss, improving access by improving farmers' income because it's increasing quality and therefore the price farmers can receive. It's improving utilization in terms of reducing food, uh, potential food contaminants. And it's improving stability. So it's, the, it's kind of a nice thing. It's a simple in way technology, but it's having these multiple effects um, that lead to a, a pretty good, pretty quick payback rate, particularly for maize also, but also for wheat. And, and even for rice, rice it takes a little, again, a little longer. Thank you, Professor. Very rich, very detailed. I think first time I saw some numbers. I'll have some micro questions. Uh, food safety, the aflatoxin, did you account for uh, savings in medicine or health, health aspect to capture this? Secondly, uh, how many seasons that can be used so that you, uh, you know, if it is five times or six times or three times, that the cost is not just for one season. So the BC ratio has to be seen, what is accumulating day and over three seasons, five seasons. But that's between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, no, that thanks. So no, this I, I have to open for all of this. I can't be. Uh, first to the organizers, how much time do we have because we will be now cutting into your lunch time. And we don't have time yet, but we can take two questions. Just two questions. I have already given five questions. <laughs> uh, can you open the floor for collecting questions at least and then respond uh, if possible? Yes, please. Uh, this is from an uh, Africa context. I find that very interesting. Was this statistic statistically significant, and why uh, do you have any uh, reasons, you know, on how you could explain this uh, scientifically? Thank you.
from the perspective of the seller. Okay, I'm glad to share it with you, not that. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, first uh, let the speakers uh, respond to the questions. Uh, why don't you start with uh, all the questions that you for, for four seasons? Uh, it, so it's so far. I mean, there's still that's partially that's that's as long as they've been in the field. They maybe longer. Um, for so so yes, we it's 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 noticeable that like therefore that for all three rings that we looked at, they should they more than pay for themselves over those over that time time period. Um, for the high aflatoxin counts, we were or, or the numbers. I I don't know. I mean, it's of course aflatoxin is very variable. Like some season it'll be bad, some season it'll, it won't be bad. And we may have, I think we picked we managed to pick a, a heck of a season. We tried we did test a number of different places. storing in tube bags which you know had pre previously had rain in them so I mean it we think part of part of it might be that just there, there was a reduction in terms of odor etc etc where where they were storing them um, we do know that these bags have suffered rodent damage in other places but but we weren't finding it yeah thank you uh, mr. seller <laughs> well, market right here. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity also to um, to look at it from that perspective. Um, generally, it's bad business. I'll explain you why. The margins on this product are extremely low, and the expectations are very high. What you are doing now are describing all that you're using basically public funds or donor money in order to introduce the authority. That's wonderful. Okay, and we love to sell to you, but do we look at it as a feasible business? No. And as a matter of fact, uh, a couple of years ago in Kenya, there was a, a, an, an effort, a very serious effort, supported by the World Bank and some other uh, institutions in order to push private um, companies like Grain Pro, like Pigs or whatever it was to drive them to give incentives to sell to farmers and it became a flop because the margins that we make on these bags do not allow us to finance the marketing that at the moment you're doing from the public funds. So the answer is, well, it would only work if there would if there would be a government that would subsidize it. But do not expect that ever a private company with the margins that we have in those banks, we can set up a decent marketing organization. It's too complicated, too costly, and you cannot expect uh, any company, rich as it may be, to enter a business where it's just going to lose money in a big way. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have my three minutes. I must uh, admit, all these uh, very detailed uh, presentations that we had, good learning, I'm still a little lost. Because my attempt had been to find out, is it a business model, exactly what you're saying, which can sustain itself with some initial push here and there, or is it a perpetual subsidy-based system? <coughs> now, on one side I was hearing 70% subsidy, otherwise it doesn't work, willingness to pay three times more than the actual one, but still a 60-70% subsidy. But here, something fresh came up, that it can pay even in one season. 
Now, the whole cost being paid in one season, and if it is applicable, it can be used for four seasons, it's a massive four is to one uh, benefit cost ratio. It should be a rolling business success story. So, only thing is communication, information as we trip about what this technology is about. So, people are ignoring, they are not aware. Or, if you are, you know, uh, your whole analysis needs to be put to a robust test. If somebody is questioning that your aflatoxin volumes that you are taking, the levels, uh, are out of uh, any thinkable range, but you are not accounted for the benefits of controlling that uh, to the extent I would see, I would take it to the health side. Because health is, which at a private level you may not be able to capture as much, but the society as a whole, if aflatoxin is 40%, it's creating disaster. Right. The society can come. So my submission to all those who were in this panel and very rigorous, uh, you know, presentations that have been made both in Bangladesh, Bihar, and uh, Bihar was the focal point, and that's the right place to do this. But the numbers still vary from each uh, presentation to the other, and. You know, any policy, you cannot come up with a policy, the farmer is willing to pay only 30% of the cost, when the benefit is four times the cost. So there is something missing, because we are not able to convince to the farmer the benefits of the technology, or demonstrate it. You know, this is where pilots are needed, to show once the farmers know that it can give him 400% return on investment, Oh, it should be a revolutionary thing. I think that's where we as researchers or we as disseminators of that research uh, have, not ever, have not done our job uh, uh, as well. You know, as usual, we do our number crunching here, but dissemination further, uh, that's where if we always had uh, a communication director, right? Klaus. <laughs> I think we need to pick up these numbers. I would submit Alex and Shai. I'm willing to put in my time pro bono basis to write two or three op-eds on this, making people aware at a higher policy level, but also at a farmer level through local uh, languages and media. That this is a new product, this can give you this much benefit, and this is what the results have been obvious. So first, what Alex in the morning said, information. Information asymmetry leads to successful technology is remaining dead. But I am a strong believer that even if information goes, unless the economics of it works out right, uh, you can be limping on government policy support for some time, but how long? I think we are in search of really sustainable business solutions. And I would love to go a little beyond farms. And that's where, with all the due regard, Dr. Singh, uh, in the morning my question, that 65% is uh, stored by the farmers, maybe in the first month or maybe in the second month. I got the numbers now from statistics at a glance. The marketed surplus, that means after taking care of the self-consumption by the farmers, in India for rice is 84%, wheat is 74%, maize is 88%, jawar is 66%. So the marketed surplus of grains in this country, on an average you can take 70 to 75%. That means farmers do not keep for such consumption more than 30 percent if these numbers are correct. No, my government agree. Because it made me uncomfortable, so I did my job of, uh, uh, and this is from statistics at a glance uh, right away, so you can verify that. Why I'm saying this all is, farmers cannot store their grain for long, not because they don't have a technology, but because Dr. Jai was referring about that. The problem is that they need cash immediately after harvest. So they need to get rid of the grain. They don't want to keep it for long. They have capacity to hold. And that's where warehouse receipt systems 
need to be developed. And that's where the champions are sitting here. So your bus real business with the private sector has to come, those who store for a longer time, because the harvest will come at a point of time, and the consumption will be throughout the year. Somebody has to store and continuously release, and farmer doesn't have the credit enough, the financial strength uh, to store that. It will be with the private sector. And something, of course, in this country, public sector, because of the public distribution system, stores uh, you know, anywhere uh, 60, 70, 80 tons of uh, tanks. So you have to work with the private sector, big ones, and they can afford if they see this is the benefit and how much uh, saving is in fumigation. You do the benefit cost analysis and tell all your warehouse guys, you know, this is the technology which can save on the cost. And that's where the market has to be developed and that's when sellers will feel happy rather than going to the government every time, give us some subsidy here, some subsidy there. I'm not sure. But uh, if in the initial business, for the promotion of new technology, some initial subsidy has to be given, I can go for that, but I can tell you what my experience with subsidies is. Once it is given, it is very hard to get off. And then it becomes a perpetual thing. So if you give 100% subsidy, that is the worst. 90% a little bit. If you want to really give subsidy, let it be 30% subsidy, 70% farmer. 50% subsidy, 50% farmer. The moment you go below that, I think we are damaging uh, the economics of the whole thing. I'm sorry about that. But we are already 10 to 15 minutes uh, above our uh, lunch time. Thanks to the organizers and please a big hand to the presenters. Thank you very much, Dr. Bilati, for very efficiently chairing and coordinating this session. Um, may I ask uh, Sarah from ADMI to please bring in the gifts for the panelists? The chair, could I please ask you to felicitate the panelists? sessions. One last thing before we head to lunch is the group photograph. We are taking the group photograph at the steps of the entrance of this very building on the ground floor. Our colleagues will direct you to there. So can I ask everyone to proceed to the photo and